All right. Can everyone see this okay? Yes. And can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, I will just go ahead and get started then. Um, thanks, um, Dan and Francis, for the great talks uh, earlier this morning. Uh, I have a talk today on something called clonal hematopoiesis in the kidneys, not a talk I thought I'd be giving um, or anything I, I knew anything about just a couple of years ago. And let's see if I can try to get people excited about this topic um, and at least learned about something interesting that's going on in a, in a different field. Okay, so I can advance my, okay. And uh, overview of my talk, I'm gonna talk about, so I'm gonna review a hematopoiesis briefly, talk about this condition called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, talk about some of the consequences of the condition and some of our preliminary data from a study called TopMed. All right, so to get into it, uh, so hematopoiesis, <clears throat> we make uh, about a billion uh, white blood cells per hour. And we do so by this complex process. We learned about a bunch of this stuff in medical school where we have <clears throat> these pluripotent hemopoietic, hemopoietic stem cells uh, that can uh, start differentiating down a pathway. They can early on decide if they wanna become lymphoid or myeloid progenitors. And then from those, uh, those states, they can then go on and differentiate further uh, for the lymphoid precursors can become T cells, B cells, or NK cells. <clears throat> the myeloid progenitors can become any number of different uh, granulocytes, monocytes, and even platelets and erythrocytes. And this hematopoietic process occurs throughout our lifetime. In fact, existing uh, data even suggests that it increases with older age, despite the fact that our marrow is, uh, bone marrow gets, gets progressively filled with fat. So bone marrow is the primary site of hematopoiesis, but as we've learned before, hematopoiesis can occur outside of the bone marrow and sites include the spleen, liver, lymph nodes, and even the kidneys. When hematopoiesis occurs in the bone marrow, the bone marrow microenvironment plays a, a large role in the major processes that govern this, um, this whole cycle. They've sort of divided where the hematopoiesis occurs in the bone marrow into two sites. One is the endosteal niche, which is the part that occurs in the marrow that's closer to where the bone actually is versus the vascular niche, which is closer to where the, sign, the actual um, blood flow goes into the bone marrow. And you can see here, there's the myeloid and, and uh, lymphoid progenitors. And those cells have to decide if they're gonna self-renew and then go on to become to stay progenitor cells or start to differentiate down the various pathways, in which case that's sort of the end, will be the end of their life cycle. And existing research shows that within the bone marrow, there does appear to be separate populations of quiescent versus active progenitor cell populations. Now we've known for actually quite a long time that mutations can occur in the hematopoietic process. And it makes sense. The process is happening very quickly. There's potential for DNA damage. And if DNA repair doesn't keep up, there's a potential that an aberrant clone could result. And then that clone can get out into the circulation. We've known about this because of the, the fortuitous fact that one of the cell types makes a particular product that we can detect clonally. So if there's a mutation along the B cell to plasma cell uh, line, and you end up with a plasma cell clone that circulates, that clone happens to make a monoclonal antibody and we can detect it as an M spike. So we've known for a while that there's potential for clonal populations in blood and MGUS is sort of the model of that. We, we see the, the spike uh, in the gamma region of the, of the electrophoresis. And we've learned that this inc the incidence of having this condition, monoclonal gammopathy increases steadily with age and that this is a pre-malignant state that could ultimately transform into cancer. But what about the possibility of mutations in other parts of the line? Uh, do those happen and can we detect that? So in particular, people have been wondering about mutations that might occur early, even before the differentiation to a common lymphoid versus myeloid um, precursor. If there's mutations in the hematopoietic stem cell process early on, we would expect that there'd be some clonal lymphoid and myeloid progeny that would, could potentially develop from this mutated clone. 
And to get a, an idea of how people first figured this out, to go back to, again, a, a med school concept that I had to review again, which is X inactivation. And the concept is that in women, one X chromosome is randomly inactivated in every cell during development. And then that remains inactivated throughout lifetime. And we have this, this cat who really needs to be compensated um, for all the time she spent on different um, educational materials about X inactivation. The cat has a, a, a black and a gold um, fur gene on the X chromosome. And this random inactivation results in this beautiful black and gold coloration. And so sort of uh, a lot of the stuff about clonal homotopies has started with this really interesting character uh, in Montreal, uh, Lambert Busk, who was curious about whether some of this clonal uh, activity in blood cells was actually happening. And it was difficult to be able to detect it. What he ended up doing is using this X chromosome inactivation uh, concept. He selected 295 women who were heterozygous for a human uh, androgen receptor gene that happens to reside on the X chromosome. And you would expect in such women that in blood, there'd be about a 50-50 mix of the two different genotypes due to random X inactivation. And he looked at newborn uh, women who were 28 to 32 years old. I don't know why he picked that range. And then women who were older than 60. And he, he found back in, this is in the mid 90s, that there were a subset of women in this population who were the, of the older women who had this strong clonal skewing. They had 10 times more of one of the Humira genes than the other, suggesting that there might be some kind of clonal activity happening in blood. He then went on to, to look at these women who had this clonal skewing and found that the, in the clonal population, the, the majority of the, these women had a mutation in one gene called TET2. Now, the next step should have been to go see if this process occurred in other people in the general population outside of Montreal. Um, and men and, and all that, but it took a while because existing genetic technology or the early gen genetic te technologies were not really suited to picking up clonal populations. As a quick review, when we do genetic testing, we take a, a blood sample from a person, we spin it, uh, we get the Buffy coat is right in the middle here where all the white cells are, so that's where the DNA is. We carefully pipe it out the Buffy coat, put it on one of these fancy machines. And when the machine is sequencing or getting polymorphisms, it of course sees tons and tons of DNA strands. And so at any given position, here's an example. Uh, there may be uh, an A at this position, an A at this position. Now, here is a DNA strand where there's a different polymorphism at the same position. And in the earlier genetic technologies, that would be considered an error, right? Because 99% of it would be A and 1% might be C. So that's just a, it's a machine error. And at that particular locus, it would read an A. So these the, the earlier technologies are not really suited to finding clones. The other problem is that early genetic technologies don't measure every nucleotide. When you put it into the machine, it goes along the, the genome and measures a few uh, uh, gene, uh, polymorphisms specifically. So here in this example, it'll if the DNA strand is laid out here, it'll measure this particular um, uh, locus here and then this locus here, and then this locus here. And once it knows the measured uh, polymorphism, the, the measured uh, values, the A, the T, and the G, it can impute or guess at what the, the sequence is in between. And this works okay uh, for the general process of just genotyping a person because the imputation is, is pretty good. But when you're talking about trying to figure out if there's a clone, if the clonal mutation is in the imputed area, it's gonna be very tricky for earlier technology machines to figure out whether a clonal population is there. With the arrival of next generation sequencing, it was possible to detect clonal leukocyte populations. Here's just an example where um, DNA again is, is laid out. And what's happening now is that, uh, first of all, the newer sequencing uh, machines are, are actually measuring all or a large number uh, of, of variants across the, the genome. And it's doing so with 
a large number of reads. So at each locus, it's reading over and over and over and over again. And this time, if there's an aberrant clone that has a different sequence, it's able to distinguish that from actual background noise using a bunch of statistical techniques to separate error from real differences. So with the arrival of next generation sequencing, it was learned that up to 30% of people have a clonal subpopulation of peripheral leukocytes. And this probability of having a clonal subpopulation increases progressively with older age. And like the original cohort from Montreal, when they looked at these clonal leukocyte populations, they found that they have mutations in a very specific number of genes. Here's a sort of graphical picture of the same thing. There's the hematopoietic stem cell population. It's acquiring these different mutations. But if it acquires a mutation in one of these specific so-called driver genes, that mutation somehow confers that leukocyte a survival advantage. And then it starts to grow out of proportion to the other leukocytes and develops into a clonal population. So saying that th th these clonal populations have mutations in a limited number of genes that are were previously thought of as, as cancer driver genes, and here's the list of them. Most of them are in these genes, DNM, T3A, TET2, and AXL1. There are also some in TP53 and JAK2, and then these uncommon ones. And these genes that comprise the majority of the uh, mutations in the clonal populations are mostly involved in very major uh, DNA regulation pathways, specifically epigenetic regulation. So DNM3TA is a, an enzyme that methylates DNA. TET2 is involved in DNA methylation. AS, ASXL1 is involved in histone methylation. So when you modify either DNA or histones in this way, it leads to major changes in, in the regulation of genes across a large region. After all of this research coming in, around 2015, uh, David Steemsa and his colleagues decided to define this condition. And they named it clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, or CHIP. And they defined it as harboring a clonal population that comprises at least 2% of your peripheral leukocytes, a mutation in a specific CHIP driver gene, and the absence of clinical hematologic disease, or cytopenias. Brian, there's a quick question from Ian. What types of leukocytes are being measured here? Neutrophils or something else? Right. So in all of these early studies, they're measuring all peripheral leukocytes. They're just taking the, the, you know, the Buffy coat out of, out of blood and measuring all of them. So you're getting monocytes, neutrophils, um, lymphocytes as well. And as expe the expectation is that since the mutation is happening at an early stage of hematopoiesis, it's present in all of these cell types. But as we'll see going forward, the implications of the mutation depend a bit on the type of cell that's affected by it. So now that we had a disease or a condition named CHIP, people were able to go out and look to see how common it is. And so here, here's, here's a, a few different estimates of its prevalence. Not too much um, of this in, in young age, although some people uh, in their 50s and 60s do, do have this condition. It goes up to about 5% in, uh, in, in age 60, up to 10% age 70, and then just goes higher and higher from then, then on. Now, this definition was dependent on a lot of factors that were present in 2015, so it might change, and it might turn out that all of us harbor some degree of clonal uh, hematopoiesis. It's going to, the definition of the disease is going to depend on the threshold used to define an abnormal population. Currently, it's 2%. <clears throat> that was mostly based on the technology that was able to detect clonal um, populations. So it's going to depend on the evolving technology itself uh, and the specific genes that are defined as driver genes. So why do we care about this? Uh, so 
one of the first early considerations and sort of obvious expected consequences of having a, a clonal a leukocyte population is a risk of future hematologic malignancy. And in fact, people who have CHIP are at about 10 times higher risk of developing a, a hematologic malignancy, either myelodysplastic syndrome, leukemia, lymphoma. And that risk is about a half a percent a year. It's related to the size of the clonal population and the transformation from chip to actual uh, neoplasm is suspected to be caused by it, a second hit, either to the same gene um, that has the mutation in the first place or to a second uh, major cancer gene. The twist came in 2017 with this um, article in New England, New England Journal of Medicine by Jay Zwall and colleagues showing that people who had chip uh, had about a two times higher chance of having prevalent coronary, coronary artery disease. And this is data from two different cohorts comparing people with and without the, prevalent, uh, the presence of this clonal mutation adjusted for age and other uh, factors. And again, it's a, it's a two times higher chance. I, I'm one of those people, I actually still get New England Journal of Medicine delivered in print every week. So I remember distinctly uh, reading this <clears throat> article, not completely understanding what clonal hematopoiesis was, but immediately thinking about the kidneys and wondering about how this might be operative when it comes to kidney disease. Subsequent studies have confirmed and extended this idea that a clonal hematopoiesis is associated with cardiovascular disease. This is the association of CHIP with incident cardiovascular events in the large UK biobank uh, data, database. And again, this, in this instance, it's a 1.6 or 60% higher chance of, of cardiovascular, uh, incident cardiovascular events associated with the presence of CHIP. And there's been some really nice work uh, in science and in, in nature. Um, a lot of these, these, since this is a hot topic, a lot of the stuff gets published there. Uh, they have these interesting animal models to recapitulate the human condition. They start with a LDL receptor uh, uh, deficient mouse model, and they do lethal irradiation, and they reconstitute the bone marrow with hemopoietic stem cells. And when they reconstitute, they can reconstitute it with stem cells that have a 10% clonal population with the mutation in TET2, or with just regular uh, hematopoietic stem cells without any uh, with the mutation. So they're trying to just have a small subpopulation that then grows out and mimics the condition of CHIP in humans. And they found that in these models that there's in the, the mice that are transplanted with the subset of TET2 negative uh, hematopoietic stem cells, there's more coronary artery plaque size. And in, this is aortic root uh, atherosclerosis. It's hard to appreciate, but in the, in the right picture, there's much more um, atherosclerotic disease in the aorta as a result of being transfused with these TET2 negative hemopoietic stem cells. And further work into this to understand the mechanism has really focused on monocytes and the idea that these circulating monocyte, the circulating monocyte population that's clonal is particularly active and is participating in atherogenesis, either directly by being involved in the atherosclerotic plaque itself or by being near the atherosclerotic plaque and secreting cytokines and other inflammatory markers in an exaggerated way compared to not normal monocytes. Now, in going through this, this work, there's one paper uh, that also looked at a mouse model of atherosclerosis. Again, they irradiated the bone marrow and they reconstituted either with normal cells or with these cells that have um, a small proportion of clonal populations. And in the animals that had the clonal populations, they saw not only increased atherosclerosis, but increased cardiac mass and increased cardiac fibrosis. And then there was the sentence in there, the experimental groups had increased kidney fibrosis as well, data not shown. So that's all we got. But again, it sort of makes sense uh, if we have this aberrant monocyte clone or aberrant, aberrant leukocyte population with these monocytes that are overactive and they're contributing to, to fibrosis, it's kind of starting to make an enticing story, at least for, for, for looking. We know that tubular incisional inflammation is a hallmark of all progressive kidney diseases. Monocytes are recruited either from 
uh, excess, excessive proteinuria from glomerular disease, and they get into the interstitium, they govern and secrete all kinds of inflammatory cytokines that ultimately can promote inflammation and, and fibrosis. So all of this reading made me very interested in this question. Could CHIP play a role in the incidence or progression of kidney disease? And to address it, we started out by looking at a study called TOPMED, the NHLBI Transomics for Precision Medicine program. And what I thought this was gonna be was, and as it's advertised, it's a collaborative program to integrate genetic data across all these cohort studies to facilitate research. But really it's just a group handshake. There's no funding for it. And you end up having to call each of the individual studies yourself um, and having asked them for the data and they don't usually give you the data because there's no real motivation for them to do anything. <clears throat> and it's hard to line it up and it's hard to figure it all out. So that's why this has taken uh, two years so far to have any preliminary data. We eventually did get data. We obtained whole exome sequencing data. So that's next generation sequencing data where you could actually get a sense of chip from six existing cohort studies. They're listed here. Most of them are commu they're, they're community based studies um, of, of cardiovascular disease. And there's no selection specifically for kidney disease. And in these studies, from the exome chip data, we're able to determine whether or not chip was present using something called the Mutech algorithm, which is basically just a computerized program to distinguish between error and clonal populations. And this algorithm has been developed to, to, for specifically for that purpose. And so the first thing we did was just look at the prevalence of CHIP uh, in these different populations. And we found that it ranges from about three to 14% and is completely dependent on age. It's again, an exponential distribution. The older you are, the more likely you are to have this clonal population. Uh, it didn't seem to differ uh, by sex. Now, some of these cohorts were selected by self-reported race. And so, for example, in Eric, most of the people who have genotype data were white, uh, same in CHS and ja in Jackson Heart, it's, in Framingham, it's all white and Jackson Heart, it's all African-American. So the only real cohort that you, we have to try to get a sense of whether or not there's a race difference um, in CHIP is MESA, which was specifically selected to, or it was specifically selected participants to uh, vary across race ethnicity. And in MESA, we didn't really see any strong race difference in the prevalence of CHIP across people who were white, uh, self-reported white, black, Chinese, or Hispanic. The kidney data, so most of these people, again, community-based study, they pretty much have normal kidney function at baseline. And they have usually one or two or maybe three follow-up uh, measurements of creatinine five, 10, 15 years later. We don't see any obvious association of CHIP with the baseline level of GFR. This slide shows <clears throat> the number of people who had a 30% decline in their EGFR over the follow-up period <clears throat> and the incidence rate of this outcome stratified by CHIP status. And you can see there is a somewhat higher uh, incidence of a 30% decline in EGFR in people who have CHIP compared to those who don't across the different cohorts. And this is a forest plot of the association of CHIP with a 30% decline in EGFR adjusting for age, age squared, genetic ancestry, and the baseline level of, of GFR. And it's, it's sort of heterogeneous. So in, in ERIC and in cardiovascular health study, it looks like the presence of CHIP is associated with a higher chance of a 30% um, decline. In other studies, not as clear. And in our meta-analysis of all the studies, there's no significant association of CHIP with ch this 30% decline in EGFR. So we sort of did what we could with the data we had. This is really all the chip data that's out there. Uh, there's certainly plenty of limitations of this first look. There was really relatively few kidney function decline events. The population didn't really have much kidney disease, disease at baseline. I think this process might be more operative in people who have existing kidney disease by contributing to its progression. And of course, changes in kidney function 
within the normal range are really not very well captured by creatinine-based measures of GFR, especially just one or two measurements over follow-up. All right, so to sum up uh, what we've learned, uh, so older age associated with the development of this clonal leukocyte population that harbors these specific cancer driver mutations. And CHIP itself is defined as having a 2% or more clonal leukocyte population in the absence of clinical hematologic disease or cytopenias. And we can measure CHIP now here at UW if you happen to want to, I don't think we need to, but um, we have the sequencing, uh, the, the clinical genetic lab can do this. It's the presence of CHIP is associated with future risk of hematologic malignancy, much in the way that MGUS is associated with the future risk of um, multiple myeloma. Interestingly though, this condition is also associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And it's possible that this condition plays some role in the progression of, of kidney disease. We just don't know any of that yet. That's what I've got. I'll stop and, and take questions. Thank you, Brian. Ian's got a, a follow-up question. So did you look at albuminuria as an outcome in top med, perhaps more related to inflammation? Right, um, we did, and it was more related to that. I just don't have the data with me. This is all pretty new. Um, so we need to look at, we need to add that to the, that's, that's a good point. We need to add that to our ongoing analyses. Stuart asks, are there null mice for the top genes you showed in the table and do these mice have kidney disease? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, null mice, so completely null mice for these genes are gonna have cancer um, more than anything else, right? I mean, these are cancer driver genes. So if you are completely null, it's gonna be a cancer phenotype. What's happening here though, in these animal models is they're just reconstituting a small clonal population with these mutations. And that's where we're seeing a relationship with chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease. So you'd have to make a mouse model <clears throat> specifically with just a small proportion of, of these. I don't know if in, those can if in the full knockout models, um, along with the cancer, if they have kidney disease as well, good luck. Dr. Musinski. Yeah, great talk, Brian. So one thing um, way back when, before probably most of you were born, um, Bendit in the Department of Pathology looked at atherosclerotic lesions and he found that they were clonal. So if you take an aorta, they did it by um, essentially looking for uh, X inactivation and every different lesion was a clone, which I'm wondering may sort of relate to um, you know, now understanding the mechanism behind that. That's a great question. I, you know, and I, I think, I think Philip Fialco was part of that whole thing as well. If I'm, cause I was, when I was going back to look at some of this X activation clonal stuff, there were Fialco papers as well um, in there as defining clonal populations early on. Uh, but I didn't see anything with the, with the atherosclerotic plaque um, thing. That's really interesting. Uh, it'd be fun to see if that was true in the, interstitial infiltrates in some of these chronic kidney diseases. Um, and then Ian says, kidney biopsy study is a great next direction in relationship to inflammatory infiltrates and fibrosis. Yeah, it would be great um, to try to harvest the inflammatory cells from a biopsy and see if there's a clonal subpopulation in there. It may also be that the clonal cell population, though, it may not directly infiltrate. Uh, it could also sort of be stand, sort of be standing by and promoting inflammation by secreting different cytokines and things like that. All right. Any last questions for Brian? Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, int very interesting area that I knew nothing about. So thank you. Um, I did want to just uh, give Anne a chance to ask her question of Dan uh, before we close uh, for the day. I think you're on mute, Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, appreciate that. And, you know, the three fantastic talks today, um, thanks to the speakers. Um, I just really wanted to 
really congratulate Dan on the work that he has been quietly doing for many years um, to really advance um, his vision and a vision that you know many of us in the field share for sort of improving end of life care for our patients. And you know, I don't know if people realize just how amazing the work he's doing is, and he's done it by really from the ground up building relationships um, within NKC, building relationships with collaborators around the country who are doing really innovative work. He mentioned um, Jane Shell. And so I just, for, that was my first goal was to just, you know, congratulate Dan on, on his work. Um, what I wanted to ask him, and this might be a big question, so Dan, feel free to, we can take it up later, but I was really curious because my guess is that Dan, your your vision is to is to scale, you know, to see something like this applied elsewhere and applied more broadly. And I was really curious, you know, because you're special, NKC is pretty special, Pacific Northwest is pretty special. Like, I was curious in your um, conversations with with various different stakeholders, um, if you saw if if you saw this as something that can be scaled up, and if so. You know, what insights have you gotten as to what that would take? Yeah, um, well, first, thanks, Anne. Those are very kind words. Um, I think the fastest way to scale this is to have a change in Medicare policy. And, you know, people are working on that. Um, you know, Jane's group, they are uh, going to be doing some qualitative work as well as looking at some of the cost data. I think that the challenge is going to be, like, do we have the numbers to show what Medicare wants um, to see? Uh, you know, clearly with, uh, you know, 60 or so decedents and seven people receiving concurrent care, like that's just not gonna be enough to convince them. But can we pool our data? Um, what is gonna, I'm interested to see how many, um, uh, uh, entities that enter the KCC model actually have some form of concurrent care as well. And, you know, are we able to show sort of improved, it's going to be administrative data like hospice utilization and length of stay uh, that's increased as well as something that is cost neutral. Um, I think that's the fastest way to get parity for our patients. This is not, I mean, this is, this is, I just want to be clear that this is, uh, sort of getting our patients on the same footing as, you know, other patients with advanced serious illness. Um, and that's a good start. Um, I think there's still more work to be done. And HPCO is really interested in doing this. And I think, um, you know, and they have their legislative team on this already. Um, and so there's been sort of work uh, that NKC is doing, Suzanne as well. Uh, uh, in, in terms of legislative advocacy. So, you know, I'm hopeful, but uh, I think uh, the jury's still out. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Dan. Dan, um, I, we'll, we'll end here. I just wanted to remind everyone that next Friday, um, there is no uh, nephrology grand rounds. In its place will be this session on bias reduction in internal medicine. Uh, most of us, I think all of us should have received a, an email from Dr. Young about that. I think Ro will be sending out another email uh, with some more details. Um, with that, hope everyone has a good uh, rest of the day and a good weekend. Um, take care.